Hi guys, thank you for joining the live stream. Today it's a big day for our podcast. It's a huge, huge honor to have someone whom you are a huge fan of. This man is viral all over India for the last two years. He has been impressing so many people. He has been pissing so many people off. So welcome to our show, Salvatore Babones, sir. It's a great pleasure to be invited. Thank you very much. And as co-host today, we have with us mysterious sociologist, so that he can ask more intelligent questions than me because he <laughs> is inside the academia as well. No, that doesn't guarantee intelligence. But okay. let's let's go on. <laughs> <laughs> so, sir, uh, first question is uh, how how is India treating you? You have been visiting India countless times. <coughs> how do you like this country? Nothing countless about it. It's been four times, and oh. uh, I've enjoyed it a lot. And but unfortunately. Um, Three of the four trips, I hardly left a hotel. Oh. Uh, I only had, so, I mean, I went to Mumbai and um, didn't leave the, well, left the Grand Hyatt for lunch once. Oh. And even then, I didn't get to go into town. Uh, only on one trip did I have any real time to myself, and that was um, uh, in last February, 2023, when I was a visiting professor at Benares Hindu University for a week. I see. And that gave me the opportunity to see Varanasi and my first trip to the Ganges with uh, in the company of cows, which felt really appropriate. I did a little video of it. Uh, mm. The first time I saw the shores of the Ganges was at the Asi Ghat in the company of about a dozen cows and a couple of goats and some dogs. And um, it felt like a really the right way to see the Ganges. Yeah. So then let's start with the first uh, question, the, the basic topic of the podcast. Since uh, you yourself uh, said in that viral interview with Rajdeep Sardesai that it seems that our intellectuals who are being surveyed for these uh, indices, they seem to be anti-India. And a lot of it comes from sociology departments, if not also political science departments, etc. So why not defund a subject like sociology? First, let's be clear. Uh, that phrase uh, is often taken out of context. I know when anything that goes viral is always out of context. My point there was to emphasize to Indians who always have this narrative that the West is against India. There's a defensive nationalism of Western rating organizations are putting down India. What I wanted my audience to understand was those ratings, although they bear the branding of the Western media organization or the Western rating organization, the ratings are coming from Indian intellectuals. That is, especially the VDEM, Variety of Democracy Institute rankings, but also the Press Freedom Index, um, you know, even a lot of the International Religious Freedom Index. A lot of that is coming from the reports of Indian intellectuals telling Western authorities about mm -hmm. the situation in India, and not just Indian intellectuals, Iranian intellectuals raiding Iran, Indonesian intellectuals raiding Indonesia. Okay. Um, so the it's the the plea, it's Indian intellectuals for anti-India. The emphasis is on Indian, not on intellectuals, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's it's not Western intellectuals. They they might be anti-India too, but the negative rankings aren't being aren't their <coughs> origin is not the Western intellectuals. Their origin is the Indian intellectuals. As for how, whether or not you should fund those intellectuals, many of them aren't funded. So, for example, I strongly suspect that the World Press Freedom Rankings, which come from reporters sans frontiers, I strongly suspect that most of their survey respondents work in the marginal online media spaces. Uh, I suspect most of them are not mainstream journalists for top Indian newspapers or uh, television stations. Now, I don't know that. What I do know is that I have never met, or at least not one that I've asked, I've, I've never met a bona fide accredited journalist in India who has admitted to being a panelist for Reporters on <laughs> Frontiers. So I, I don't know who's doing, who's answering those surveys, um, but they may not be people who are receiving high salaries. Now, for VDEM, Variety of Democracy Institute, they're surveying mainly Indian political scientists. Um, should they be funded? Of course they should be funded. I mean, people have a right to their own opinions. The problem is not that they have an opinion. The problem is that we take their opinion seriously. Aren't we supposed to, since they are the only people we can look at, the, the most credentialed academics of our country? They are the most credentialed academics of your country. I, you know, now, I don't know. Again, I don't know the exact people, but VDEM is very uh, dedicated 
to finding out the most properly credentialed people for each of its questions. It's a very highly professionally run survey. That said, there are serious methodological problems with the VDEM uh, approach, and I've criticized those separately. Hmm. But as far as who they're asking, uh, I've had lots of people come to me with this and say, well, why are they asking this Marxist professor at, you know, JNU or at whatever? And I said, well, if you designed a survey of democracy, would you ask a ultra conservative podcaster or would you ask a professor of political science? survey to democracy, you'd probably ask a professor of political science. And if you said my survey is based on a survey of politicized or highly political podcasters, no one would take your survey seriously. Right. So then why are only uh, are are the intellectuals of other countries also uh, not supposed to criticize their country? Why aren't those countries also showing up so very lower than India in their list? Countries which are actually objectively weaker than us. I mean, in bad. I think there's a I think there's a specific quandary for India in that India is the only poor country. And I'm sorry to state this categorically. Maybe I shouldn't be quite so categorical. It is the only large poor country. Let me put it that way. If we leave aside tiny countries that I may not know much about, I I don't know the quality of democracy in a small Caribbean island state or something like that, you know, but uh, among larger countries, India is the only poor country that is a well-institutionalized democracy. The only one. Uh, I mean, and that should, that should really inform everything we do about India. So if I ask Indonesian political scientists, hmm. how is freedom of expression in India? I'm sorry, in Indonesia. Hmm. They're likely to say, it's pretty good for me hmm. because... I could only become a political scientist in Indonesia if I aligned with the values of the Indonesian government. Hmm. I can only become a political scientist in Iran if I align with the values of the Iranian government. Now, again, that's not categorical. There might be some people who are dissidents, but the point is that the dissidents are dissidents. Uh, Hmm. For the most part, they have to be aligned with Indonesia in order to be um, have a position of authority there. Uh, Indonesia has Sharia law. It's very difficult to be a an anti-Muslim hmm. academic. Hmm. You could be a skeptical Muslim. That might be okay. okay. Can you be a, you know, a vehemently anti-Muslim academic and have a job teaching political science in Indonesia or Iran or Pakistan? The answer is probably no. And if the answer is no, then when you go to ask Indonesian or Pakistani or Iranian political scientists, how's freedom of expression in your country? How's academic freedom in your country? You're asking a group of people who, to some extent, have been selected by their own regime, to some extent, because these countries, for the most part, are not genuine democracies. Now, in India, India is a genuine democracy. Everything I've seen the last five years of intensive study of India suggests that India's democracy, India's democratic institutions are roughly roughly equivalent in every major domain with democratic institutions in well-recognized Western democracies. Um, It's a pretty typical democracy from that standpoint. Institutionally, it's a pretty typical democracy. Um, Well, the result is that there are highly critical academics and journalists who are able to be highly critical and yet still have their jobs. Now, the real difference is not, you know, why does India get rated negatively, whereas, you know, Iran or Indonesia might get a pass. The real question is, why is India rated negatively when Australia and the United States get mm. rated highly, despite the fact that in Australia and the U.S., most academics are thoroughly critical mm. of their countries? Exactly. Uh, and the answer there has to do with the structure of the questionnaires and the sorts of questions they ask about. Um, so they ask questions like, is vote buying common? Hmm. You know, the rate the extent to which vote buying is common. Well, in rich countries, there's just not vote buying. Hmm. It, it's not an issue. Hmm. Um, you know, is, the, uh, is there violence at the polls? Hmm. In rich country, there's no violence. At the polls, it's not an issue. Hmm. Uh, can people form competing political parties? Hmm. Well, in rich countries, the political systems are so mature that hmm. the political parties have been there forever. 
there are no new political parties. It's not an issue of you know, people mm. being able to form their own parties. Mm. Um, can foreign organizations uh, do, can foreign NGOs do uh, research and advocacy in your country? Mm. Not a problem. No one wants to do research on American democracy. I mean, there aren't, there aren't Indian and Iranian foundations attempting to off open offices in the U.S. to do research on American democracy. Hmm. It, it's a one-way street, right? So, so all but by design, the survey doesn't ask questions that would result in a vehemently anti-establishment American political scientist rating America poorly. Hmm. I mean, they do rate America probably more poorly than they should be rate, rated. But these questions just aren't relevant hmm. from the standpoint of the United States. They are relevant from the standpoint of developing countries. Uh, and thus, India gets rated poorly relative to Western. India gets rated poorly relative to Western democracies because India is poor. Hmm. I mean, the master variable behind all of it is just hmm. that India is poor. Right. India does not do better than other poor countries because India is a democracy hmm. and there's there's an iron there's a there's a terrible irony in the fact that being a democracy allows Indians to be critical of their own democracy right so then is it a good thing or a bad thing that we have this double-edged sword of democ democracy a good thing or a bad thing that we have what sorry this double-edged sword of uh, democracy which allows uh, India to get rated so low in these indices which might hamper India's reputation investments everything Look, the problem is that these indices, that people pay attention to these indices. Mm -hmm. So in, if you want to go to investment or tangible problems, uh, indices like the VDEM subcomponents, not VDEM itself, but VDEM collects data that then goes into, for example, bond rating models, or it goes into uh, governance models right. produced by the World Bank uh, yeah. that then get put into bond rating models. So India does pay a penalty right. to, to some extent. It also creates pressure against, for example, technology sharing. If the U.S. Mm. wants to do technology sharing, there's political opposition to that with the claim that India is not a democracy. So there are minor, mm. minor, but real mm. um, tangible disadvantages due to okay. these uh, incorrect democracy rankings. Mm. Mostly, though, the problem is that people have politicized these. Um, it's simply... When when an international organization rates America poorly, and they do that all the time, hmm. Americans don't care, <laughs> right? It's not an issue. It's page twenty news. It, it's see. just it's a, you know, UN special rapporteurs are constantly coming to Australia hmm. and saying that Australia is a genocidal nation that is um, killing its Aboriginal people. Hmm. Australians shrug their shoulders. Yes, the Greens Party will put on its manifesto the un special rapporteur has you know demanded that australia but the mainstream australian political system and the mainstream australian press shrugs its shoulders because everyone knows it's not true mm. it just doesn't matter right. um but for developing countries more pressure is exerted and crucially people in i'm sorry the political class mm. in developing countries cares mm. uh so on one side of politics there's an attempt to legitimate its uh, its own uh, positions on the basis of external uh, evaluations. And on the other side of politics, there's an attempt to burnish its nationalist credentials hmm. by fighting against the international agencies. Hmm. So on both sides, these rankings are useful politically hmm. in yeah. a way that they're frankly not in America or Australia. Right. Is it a is there some some structural problems with humanities that the academics are themselves are not understanding this predicament that India is that it is a democracy but also a poor country which is still functioning as a pretty pretty good democracy so why not uh, be more objective or at least empathetic or sympathetic uh, to the country's problems and not not tarnish it? I, I don't think so. I think they're just okay. answering the survey as best they can in line with their own prejudices and I say prejudices not expertise. This is a debate I've had with political scientists repeatedly. I see. Because political scientists will say, and, and VDEM will say, we ask people who are specialists in this particular area. So, for example, uh, let's let's take a simple one. Is there vote buying in India? Hmm. Nobody knows how much vote buying there is in India. Okay. It, it, it's simply unknown. Okay. okay. 
The expert may have an opinion, hmm. but even that expert's research, if the expert research is vote buying, that research is necessarily qualitative and limited in scope. So the researcher has done interviews in one, two, ten districts in one state hmm. in India. Right. So let's say I can establish that there's vote buying within a certain caste community within a certain state in India. Even that expert, and that's the best case scenario. I'm, that's not just someone who's a political scientist who may have some knowledge. That's the person studies this. They can't know the situation for India. Um, more broadly, if you ask a question like, is there freedom of the press? How can an academic know? The extent to which so, so one of the questions, for example, is do politicians pressure news outlets uh, to cover or not cover stories to influence their reporting? Now, politicians everywhere seek to influence reporting in Australia and in America and in India. They're always like, so the question is, to what extent they do? Hmm. How can an academic answer that question? I, I mean, let's imagine it. even an academic who's a journalism professor where do they get the information to answer that question hmm. well they get the information from reading the press freedom index rating of india <laughs> right so there's a circular right. uh, again there's a self-referential or, or a circular construction of the of knowledge hmm. here so my complaint about these questions is that even the experts can't possibly have the knowledge that the survey asks them to certify and, and if you will, I'll give you a, a, a crystal clear example of this. Every year I'm asked to rate universities. Times Higher Education comes to me and says, would you please rate universities in the Asia Pacific? And they ask, what are the top 10 universities in the Asia Pacific for teaching? Now, I don't know how good the teaching is in the classroom next to mine at the University of Sydney. How can I possibly know which are the top 10 universities in the Asia Pacific? It may be that the best 10 universities for teaching in the Asia Pacific are all universities I've never heard of in Mongolia. Right. It's possible. They may be much better hmm. than Sydney or Melbourne or Tokyo. Or you know, How do I know? I have to Google yeah. best teaching universities <laughs> right? Right. because I can't know. And, and the first principle of survey research, something that the VDEM people don't seem to understand is the first principle of survey research is you can only ask people things you can expect them to know. I see. Yeah. So I can ask a journalist, have you ever faced pressure about a story? Hmm. Yeah. I can't ask a journalist, what is the state of freedom of the press in India? Right. And, uh, would it be a would, would it be a fair thing to say that uh, humanities at least in india has always been a pr arm of the government and it's only in a transition period now therefore these problems are arising because i don't think before bjp came to power we were doing so bad in these indices which meant that the uh, that the people who were being surveyed were pretty happy with the government that might be or you might problem. say that the government was the political arm of the Academia, which might, which might be a more accurate characterization, because academia is merely reflective of the uh, academia is merely reflective of the professional class of society. So, mm -hmm. if we take the proposition that academics, lawyers, accountants, mm -hmm. top executives, you know, managers, engineers, they all come from the same social class. They all talk to each other. They marry each other. They share a, a, a they form opinion together. They all read the Times of India and the Indian Express. They all have a, a shared experience of the world. Hmm. Um, for a long time, India had a government that reflected the political preferences of the educated professional classes. That's the Congress Party hmm. uh, governments. Um, post in, not the not the pre-independence congress well even the pre-independence congress party but the, the inc it wasn't a party at that point but the post-independent congress party um has broadly reflected this class and thus when their party so to speak is no longer in power yes i think there's a natural inclination for them to see the world in uh, cataclysmic terms, the same way that in the United States, U.S. democracy rankings go down every time a Republican is elected. Hmm. And they bounce back up whenever a Democrat, not just Donald Trump, you can go back 
at least as far as Richard Nixon, mm. you know, in the 19, uh, late 1960s. Mm. Um, that's because the American intellectual class is anti-Republican. Mm. There's, no, there's no surprise there. And so that this has happened in India with a realignment of India's political system in favor of, let's be honest, a broadly anti-intellectual party. Mm. The BJP is... Yeah, I know that there are BJP intellectuals, there are mm. BJP think tanks, but it's an outsider. They're outsider intellectuals. They're mm. not the old intellectual establishment of India. Yeah. And people like um, you know Narendra Modi, especially, but uh, also Amit Shah. You know, they, they are they are certainly not people who um, pay excessive respect mm. <laughs> to the intellectual class, the traditional intellectual class of India. And it's no surprise that. You know, if you have if you elect an anti-intellectual prime minister or in the U.S. a anti-intellectual president like Donald Trump or George Bush, uh, that the intellectual class will be dismissive of that person. Mm. I don't think there are any surprises here. The only surprise is that we care about it. Mm. You know, why should you care what a bunch of political scientists think about Indian democracy if even India's mainstream journalists, mm. you know, the... I mean, I follow, I mean, I, I very closely follow Shekhar Gupta. I've, I've been, you know, watching his show for five years. Mm. Uh, even Rajdeep Sardesai, who mm. I had that interview with. Mm. Um, Rajdeep recently put out a video essentially criticizing India's opposition for going on and on about the end of democracy mm. when, you know, and of course he being, giving, given his political views, he has to say, you know, but it might be soon. <laughs> you know, but, he, right. but even Rajdeep Sardesai, does not argue that India is no longer a democracy. Right. And so, you know, so who believes that, right? I mean, if, if India's mainstream journalists, even India's anti-BJP mainstream journalists, hmm. don't believe that India is no longer a democracy, why should we believe it? Right. So then, uh, is it just uh, just inevitable that uh, academia will forever, if given democracy, if if they are provided with democracy, if they are allowed to say what they want, they will forever be just anti-conservatism, anti anti fiscal conservatism, anti-nationalism, because it's the same in USA as you are saying. Republicans come to power and they are all all of a sudden angry with the government. Here, BJP comes to power, they are angry. So is it just inevitable, and we must just accept it, or does this? Uh, this defend the argument that now it needs reform or defunding? No, no. First of all, I wouldn't say it's inevitable. I would say it is a feature of the Anglosphere. And the, to the extent to which Indian intellectuals have historically been uh, inherited in English intellectual tradition and have been part of broader Anglosphere thinking, uh, it has been liberal intellectuals for the last 200 years who've been very critical of our democracies and our societies. And to some extent, that criticism has helped reform society and push it to be a better society. I mean, credit where credit is due. Hmm. That's not always been true in continental European countries. Hmm. Uh, so it's not necessarily true. For example, it's, it's no coincidence that um, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway are rated the best democracies. You know, why? Because intellectuals are very closely aligned with government hmm. in those countries. They're highly respected. They get appointed to cabinet positions. That, you know, so uh, they, think, they think highly of themselves, and so they think highly of their country's democracies. And you point out to a Swede, well, your head of state is inherited and must be a Lutheran. Mm -hmm. They don't see that as a problem, right? They shrug their shoulders and say, oh, that's just symbolic. It doesn't matter hmm. um, because that's, you know, it's their country and that's what they're used to. They tend to rate... Australia, UK, US, you know, well, I'm sorry, their, their indices rate Australia, UK, US lower, you know, than the Scandinavian countries. And right. that's because in the English speaking countries, we are more critical hmm. of our government. So we have much more contentious politics. Hmm. Now, India doesn't necessarily have to stay on that path. I know there's been a move uh, with the BJP in power centrally to change the character of um, JNU as hmm. a you know, centrally administered university. And to the extent to which uh, the BJP and other non-Congress parties, so it's not just the BJP, uh, you know, there are caste-based parties that have their prominence in South India or, or in West, I don't know West Bengal very well, but I don't know the extent to which this TMC can shape the appointment of deans and chairs of uh, departments. But if the TMC has the ability to do that, I would expect the 
the character hmm. of academia to change. Right. Uh, but that'll be a slow process. And who knows if we come back in 40 years, we might find that India is aligned more like continental Europe with captured academia. And I want hmm. to stress that might not be an improvement. Hmm. Oh, yes, it would result in a more correct democracy ranking. Right. But only coincidentally, um, would that be better? You know, sometimes, and I, and I know no one ever wants to hear this message, hmm. sometimes it's good to have someone to fight against. You know, I always tell my, my friends who are BJP supporters, they say, you know, BJP should win 300 seats. And I say, well, why not 400? Why not 500? You know, why not 600? Oh, because there aren't 600 seats <laughs> available. How many seats in the Lok Sabha now? 543. Yeah, okay. So, you know, there aren't 600 seats available. Um, but the point is, it's better for the BJP to have a strong opposition to fight against it. Hmm. Even if you're a BJP supporter, no, it's not good for India to have 540 BJP hmm. MPs. Uh, it'd be better for India, even if you're a supporter, hmm. to have a balance. And so having academics who, you know, having academia pushing back against society, getting things wrong, because I believe the academics are getting things wrong. Right. Funct from a functionalist perspective, and I am a you know, we're going to throw names around eventually. I am a Durkheimian functionalist when it comes to uh, sociology. Um, Maybe functional for society, even if it's annoying and sometimes wrong. Right. Uh, would you say that academia is, humanities academia is largely wrong or largely correct? Oh, about what? I mean, that we can't make... About criticisms of the, of the government or Indian society or even Hinduism for that matter. So first of all, I know that there are academics in India and even at JNU uh, who are very much pro BJP, highly nationalist. Um, you know, so we can't say all academics are one way or another. We're, we're talking about uh, averages and percentages. Hmm. Um, you know, are they wrong? Well, I think the consensus academic view that and this is what I've heard from peak academics in India that India has become a fascist country under Narendra Modi. Hmm. Fascist is a word that gets thrown around a lot. Hmm. I think that peak academic view is flatly ridiculous. Right. Uh, I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's so ridiculous it doesn't bear examination. Okay. And yet, my political science colleagues in India, and even many in America and Australia, believe that. It's become the, hmm. the stylized fact that India under Modi has become fascist, uh, the same way it's become a stylized fact that, you know, Donald Trump is racist. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen no evidence that Donald Trump is racist. Yes. I mean, I, and I, no evidence whatsoever. Yes. <laughs> right. I, you know, I, I mean, you know, other than a few casual remarks, yeah. you know, I mean, that Donald Trump is unguarded in his language. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, racist? No, I've seen, I've seen no evidence. Yeah. And, and the same I would say for India being fascist. There's, you know, there are unguarded remarks. So I'll give you an mm. example. Um, uh, the Home Minister Amit Shah said uh, five years ago, he used the metaphor of Muslim immigrants in Assam uh, uh, undermining a house, you know, the, the country, like termites mm. in a house. Immediately, the press said, Amit Shah compares Muslims to termites. Right. Now, you know, it's an unfortunate metaphor. An experienced politician should have known. And he's an experienced politician. He mm. should have known better to, right. than to use a metaphor. But he never said Muslims are termites, right? right? He said he was using the metaphor of illegal immigrants undermining the foundations of a house. Hmm. Um, bad metaphor. Was it used intentionally? May have been. Hmm. I don't know. Is that fascism? Well, if Amit Shah actually treated India's Muslims as termites. Hmm. Yeah, okay, we could now start using fascist metaphors about hmm. the Holocaust, about uh, you know, the treatment of Jews. Of course, Nazi, the reason the comparison is there is that Nazis depersonalized Jews by hmm. calling them insects, calling, you know, that, I believe that they even use the metaphor of termites. Uh, you know, so you can make the connection if you're desperately searching for some piece of evidence to hang on to, to call the BJP fascist. Hmm. Yeah, but, but that's a lot of, you know, fascism is a big claim to hang on an unguarded metaphor. Right. If the peak academics themselves are this wrong on this 
critical issue and this insanely unfair word that is being thrown around what does that say about academia and does doesn't that uh, defend the argument of defunding the academia or some large scale reform or should we let it go because it's it's maybe a good thing to have some opposition look my views on academia are not specific to india i recently published a book australian universities can they reform hmm. the answer is no <laughs> they okay. can't reform and personally i think a lot of the problems with the university systems in general have to do with uh university autonomy and that autonomy breeds self indulgence that is if universities have guaranteed autonomy they start to indulge their own prejudices their own political views they don't think about what society needs and my personal solution is that society should be much more closely involved in universities um there used to be in the 19th century for example and there are some vestiges of this vestiges of this still in in germany where um professorships still today in some states in germany nominally have to be approved by the state legislature mm. uh now of course now it's just done as a list and they're just you know approved unless someone super controversial comes up but they used to be debated you know the same way you would appoint a you know municipal affairs and you debate about it is this the right person you know well you would debate to appointing a university professor now i don't think it necessarily should be done by state legislatures but i think that university government boards so we have a university senate at the university of sydney most of the senate is composed of people appointed by the state of new south wales uh to sit in on in governance over the university in effect all they do now is they approve the vice chancellor the vice chancellor approves the deans the deans approve the department heads and the deans and the department heads do all the hiring hmm. well i'd like to see uh, an expanded university senate composed of people from all walks of life in our community hmm. um sit and be the people who primarily hire so i i would instead I of see. having one senator sit on a faculty committee of five academics hiring someone i put it the other way let's have five non-academics hmm. nominated to hire a professor and one representative from the academics hmm. just to answer technical questions to you know to express the views of the colleagues right um now i would like to see so that that would be a, the socially embedded model of the university right i would like to see our our university socially embedded uh but that goes so far against the existing practices that it it's inconceivable that it would actually happen i see okay uh mr sociologist has a question for you uh hi sir thanks for this riveting talk uh one thing i wanted to see interject was perhaps uh what what people miss uh in this whole exchange of academia and uh common people if i can call them that is that um not non academics uh is that uh yeah or the public is that uh, you know there the, there's a lack of um accountability in certain cases mm -hmm. in, in a sense that for example uh when when you you look at the number of phd theses on kashmir uh, uh in in various top universities of india you will see that there is a bias against the kashmiri pandit genocide there if you see okay. a number of polit you know theses uh, on on west bengal for example you will not find any mention of the few thousand political murders that happened mm -hmm. under the left regime here so somewhere you know people have stopped trusting the academics uh, people uh, you know people even like me who are a part of it we we've, we've stopped having faith in you know a representation of reality that academia is supposed to have or a critical representation i i i agree india is fascist because i live in one of the most fascist parts of india in some way i i know that you haven't visited it and this would not be the reality for i guess 90% of the country but <laughs> we're frankly ignored there are genocides there are actual murders rapes uh, in in west bengal and nobody talks about it internationally or even mm -hmm. nationally is a even shekhar gupta and other senior journalists they completely ignore a number of horrific incidents that happen in our state so it's kind of uh, where people the the distrust in academia has a has a root in these kind of incidents perhaps so yeah the the question this this was more of a comment really but you know uh, so there i i agree with you that there must be greater accountability of uh, those the you know who are funded 
by the public at large through our taxpayers or whatever. So, All right. Yeah. So, so first, you know, fascism is a strong claim. So lots of incidents don't make fascism. Uh, I do suspect that uh, Ms. Banerjee faces serious political opposition and could, in theory, lose an election. Uh, I doubt her control over West Bengal society approaches anything like uh, Mussolini's control over Italian society in the 1930s, which we might take of as the paradigmatic case of fascism. Is it more fascistic than the rest of India? I don't know. I mean, that's that's a qualitative comparison. I'm not enough of an expert to say. Uh, but when it comes to the academics, look, there. There, there has somebody ultimately has to make decisions. I mean, Carl Schmitt called that the test of sovereignty. Who makes the final decision? Sovereignty over universities today in the West is entirely self-indulgent. That is, universities have sovereignty over universities. Governments in extremis, I mean, in the in occasional cases, you know, a, a governor like uh, Rick DeSantis in, in Florida may outlaw government funding for diversity, equity, and inclusion, but the university will just find it. They'll just call it equity, inclusion, and diversity, mm. <laughs> and and still have it. Right. In, you know, in California, the voters literally passed a ballot referendum prohibiting racial quotas and discrimination based on race in California university admissions, and the universities ignored that. They ignored the spirit of it entirely and found a way around the law so that they could technically admit people on the basis of race, even though the law had said you cannot admit people on the basis. I'm sorry, they could effectively do it, despite the fact that technically the law says they can't. They're not implementing the spirit of the law. Now, I don't know to what extent Indian universities appoint their own academics. Um, I don't really know the system very well in India. Maybe you can educate me. But the question is, if not academics, I mean, I'm arguing that academics have too much, um, too much power to appoint their own. Then the question is, who? You know, somebody has to right. hire people. I don't think the answer. Well, the government should. Well, that only works if you, you know. Well, we love that because Narendra Modi's in charge. Mm -hmm. Well, wait, but well, you don't love that because <laughs> Mata Banerjee's in charge, and she'll get to appoint the people. Right. So, um, be careful what you wish for. Is a, a good aphorism. For this regard, maybe you can tell me, you know, Christoph, uh, how academics are. I know it's a joke, but that's the only name we have on screen. I, um, I, I, I know. <laughs> maybe you can tell me um, how academics yeah. are appointed in India. Uh, Frankly, I don't so. know. Uh, there is uh, typically in the in the higher education sector, there is one has to crack net or set, uh, which is a national or state level eligibility test, uh, which only a master students can uh, sit for. And once you have cracked that, uh, you get a certain qualification as lecturership or junior research fellow or both. Uh, if you qualify for lecturership, if uh, that is you're in the top 15% of it. So this is very, this is the objective aspect of it. Um, then you qualify to be a lecturer in any government institution in India, which, which is majority of the higher education institutes in India are government run. So now what happens is typically they would bring out an advertisement based on you know caste and other kind of considerations mm -hmm. that let's say there are 100 positions and 50 percent to 60 percent of them would be reserved for various uh, caste categories and all that and 40 percent right. would be open uh, for all and uh, people would uh, put up their uh, cred you know credentials like i'm a i have a master's degree i have a phd i have a mphil whatever i have these many publications and the final now here's where the government has a lot of control uh the interview panel consists usually of government appointees government or uh, appointed by vice chancellors and therein uh, many people have you know many people have grouses because uh, there are instances where someone with a phd got ignored for uh, uh, somebody with a master's degree or am phil uh, somebody who's had publications and, and, and postdoc and whatever or great teaching experience has got, you know, ignored uh, and somebody else got it. Uh, so got the job with much less experience and credentials. Well, cut to the chase. I mean, who, who sits in the panel? 
the typically if it's state appointed there will be a government's uh, nominee a governor's nominee who represents the central government interests although again these nominees are often selected by the state governments themselves mm -hmm. Uh, and typically, there would be senior professors of various. Yeah. Uh, so we're in the same boat. Senior professors appoint junior yeah, professors. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Yeah. So that's precisely. sorry to cut you short, but no, no, uh, you get it. Same system, better, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. same problems. Yeah. I, I see there's tons of comments in the chat. I did promise people we'd be taking questions. I don't know when you want to go to questions, but uh, yeah. just as a reminder, I did promise people they'd have the uh, opportunity to interact. Yeah, J just just about five ten minutes later, I have two, yeah, two yeah. Sure, more sure, important sure. questions. Uh, would you call yourself a liberal? Uh, absolutely. Do you think? Uh, uh, okay, go. But ahead. not only a liberal, okay. but but among other things, a liberal. Right. Uh, is do you think uh, BJP or this current government of India is liberal? Is a liberal politics part, a political party? Um, look, India's institutions are liberal, and the BJP operates within a liberal environment. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure that that's the BJP's preference, but the BJP accepts those terms. Hmm. Um, what the BJP, you know, would do if it were had complete control to rewrite the Indian Constitution, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, the BJP uh, operates in accordance with the Indian Constitution. Uh, mm -hmm. They are not, you know. I, so I would say my impression is that that the BJP is the B BJP intellectuals as a whole are not highly committed liberals that's not their primary interest but mm. they seem to embrace basic liberal principles and that mm. you know they seem to endorse basic freedoms mm. democracy uh rule of law i mean what does liberalism mean if not freedom democracy and right. rule of law and those are all things that the the bjp seems to accept as just a you know basic underpinning now when we get to things like liberal economic reforms hmm. well okay maybe they're not as liberal as a truly committed liberal party would be but hmm. you know, fundamentally it's it, it, it's a it's within the liberal universe and that's why when you ask me if i'm a liberal i'd say i'm not an ideological liberal in the sense that you know i think the answer to everything is more liberalism uh, i've written that i do embrace conservatism liberalism and progressivism as all being important for our political future and on many issues i would embrace principles of each of those that is i don't view these as antagonistic principles i view these mm. as three good and important sets of principles that we should embrace simultaneously mm. so I, I i am a liberal among many other things mm. uh the, the academia, humanities academia, which is mainly liberal or, or, or if not leftist, so uh, why aren't they getting that? It's it's still a liberal government that's going on. What exactly I'm, I'm is sure stopping are, them? So I'm not sure they are liberal. Um, most academics I meet in the West are not liberal, and I suspect most elite academics in India are not liberal. So when I say that they're not liberal. We always debate what does liberalism mean? What do all these terms mean? Look, if liberalism means accepting the broad classic liberal principles that began with Locke and came down to us through, uh, you know, John Stuart Mill and other you know people who are whom everybody accepts as being key liberal thinkers. I mean, there's lots of liberal thought has many different directions, but but among you know, basic principles like. Do we believe in freedom of expression? Do we believe in freedom of conscience? Uh, you, well, no, many academics are not liberals. The, you know, many academics explicitly believe that some thoughts are too dangerous to allow people to think. And that's why when you let academics or intellectuals run things, you often have repressive regimes <laughs> That, that that outlaw the press in the interest of protecting the truth because you know we can't allow untruths to be printed uh, so for example in the united states where you know recently there's there was motion in 2022 uh, 20 uh, 21 22 to create a disinformation board you know to review information and, and try to quash disinformation well that's profoundly illiberal hmm. um it may be good we could debate whether that's good or bad for democracy. I think it's bad. Hmm. Other people might think it's good. Is it liberal? Hmm. Absolutely not. Did political scientists and other university intellectuals support it? For the most part, they did. Right. Um, 
I don't think most academics are in in their behavior, whatever they may say, in their behavior, most social science academics are, I think, less liberal than the underlying populations and the underlying student bodies they teach. Hmm. What do you think of Indian society as much as you have met it? Is the society liberal or, or not? No, look, look I, I, I have not met Indian society. I only speak English, hmm. first of all. Right. Uh, I haven't traveled much in India. Mostly I interact with Indian diaspora members. So hmm. I, I, my understanding of Indian society comes from surveys, hmm and from documents, mm. not from my personal experiences. Right. From surveying documents, India is a highly traditional, highly conservative society. Mm. And so when I was saying earlier, very um, carefully, that India had Western style liberal democratic institutions that are similar to those or comparable to those in Western countries, mm. that's the institutions. Mm. The electorate is very different mm. from a Western electorate. Uh, it's an incredibly religious uh, electorate. It's a much less educated electorate. Hmm. Um, you know, it's a very profoundly conservative hmm. electorate, a much more spiritual hmm. electorate. Right. Um, you know, so it's a it, no. India is certainly not in its you know in its broader population uh, a broadly liberal country and. You know, we can see that on things like the World Values Survey. Mm -hmm. If um, the most recent World Values Survey, I don't believe has Indian data, but the older ones from the early 2000s would show India to be, you know, not uh, the, the the indicator there is not liberal. The two indicators there are uh, secularism and um, emancipative values. And we can think of emancipative values as being a kind of a stand-in for liberalism. Uh, and India does not rate particularly high on emancipative values, which is to say that if you ask people questions like, is it your child, should your children be whatever they want to be, or should your children um, respect their elders and do what their elders tell them? Hmm. <laughs> India falls much more on the do what your elders tell you yeah. side, whereas, say, Australians would fall much more on the strike out on their own right. side. So, it's, no, it's not a particularly liberal yeah. electorate. Okay. Since you mentioned Ron DeSantis, uh, I, I used to be a huge fan of his until he took this weird position this time around during the primary elections. Uh, but his defunding of uh, some streams of sociology, do you think uh, that that's going a step too far? Even Jordan Peterson was uh, critical of that particular step. No, I, look, I, I think it is... Um, it, it's sloganeering and it's jingoistic, hmm. um, but the state funds universities... And the state doesn't have to fund things that are mm. not state priorities. Right. And we may not like that. Mm. Uh, but the fact is that the state always sets priorities. And, right. you know, it, it may not sound nice. You know, we love it when the state says we're founding a nanotechnology research center. Mm. And no one says, well, what about Salvatore's comparative sociology <laughs> center? It doesn't get funded with billions of do millions of dollars of state money. And, and, you know, state makes those decisions all the time. Now, the mm. fact that it's being made in a highly public way mm -hmm. for political gain. Yeah. Yeah. But democracy is fought that way. And, uh, you know, so no, I, I think it's um, heavy handed, but not inappropriate. It's, it's up to the state. Right. Then now, in private th universities can do what they want and do, yeah. do what they want. Yeah. In that in that same way, should should shouldn't we defund some some streams or some particular kinds of research in Indian sociology as well? Like especially no, no. in terms of you, Kashmir. You're pushing caste. on that, and, and let me let me let me just parse your your question. Um, if you want to defund those things, hmm. you should try to get that on the agenda of your state representatives. Hmm. Um, there's no we about it, hmm. right? There, there's no correct answer hmm. to the question should the humanities be defunded? Hmm. The answer is Nirajan wants to defund them. Hmm. Christoph does not want to defund them. Yeah. We have a debate and one side has more political power than the other and makes a funding decision. So recently the humanities and social sciences were defunded in Australia uh, under the last liberal government. Right. Uh, they virtually eliminated what's called the Commonwealth um, subsidy for those subjects, bringing them up to market levels. So you could get a massive Commonwealth subsidy if you study nursing. You could get a pretty good Commonwealth study if you studied engineering. You'd get no subsidy at all if you studied the humanities and social sciences. 
that's not a thing that ha now that didn't get reported in the outside world as you know australia goes to war with the humanities right if that happened in india it would yeah <laughs> you know, it doesn't you know if it happened in florida it would in mm. australia it was just an administrative decision it was called the job ready graduates package mm. and the government decided that its priority was engineering and nursing and had no priority for the humanities and social sciences. I see. Uh, I was asking politics. I was asking uh, because I mean, being a senior academic yourself, would that be a good thing or a bad thing if we if we defunded things just because we don't like it? I think it's so. Uh, again, I want to remove the we. Society debating about what it wants to fund, I think, is a good thing. It okay. provides democratic accountability to what are ultimately public service institutions funded by the public. Hmm. And they should be democratically accountable. I think the democratic accountability would be good. I see. Whether, and that would push us to behave as humanities and social sciences scholars, to offer things, to do things that our larger public that funds us wants us to do. Now, they may want us to do stupid things, Hmm. But on the other hand, I might want to do stupid things, right? right? There, exactly. There's no, until God comes and tells us right. which are the right things to be studying. Yeah. You know, until God comes to tell us, forgive me, Indians, who hmm. should own Kashmir? Hmm. Well, until God comes to tell us, or, you know, hmm. a God at least comes yeah. to tell us who should run Kashmir. Well, I have my idea. You have your idea. If you want to defund an anti-India academic, hmm. you get your party together and, and get the campaign going and, and let's have this. And so what I view as a absolute positive hmm. is us having the debate, hmm. the outcome of, because it forces me to come into the public sphere to defend my job. Right. That's the good thing. Got it. Uh, Christoph has a, has a question for you. Um, yeah, it's more like, um, so there, so I've debated in my mind and with others regarding this uh, funding question. And um, I, I, you know, uh, the problem with the way research is funded in India is, and uh, it's kind of based off the GRF system, where if you uh, get a GRF uh, scholarship from the government or at an IIT or some equivalent institute, uh, you get a decent sum of money uh, for five years to pursue your PhD. Now, with the sciences, the good thing is that good or bad, whatever way you want to look at it, is that there is a lab and that usually pursues uh, something that the government wants. So if the government wants renewable energy research, uh, it will fund those kind of labs and those kind of professors and you, you want a degree. So you have to work under that professor and get your PhD and publications in the sociology and uh, associated disciplines, social sciences, humanities, uh, there is often this case that there are professors who have uh, very often, you know, majority of them have a biased view against the Indian populace and the government. And uh, I say this having been, having been a student of many of these institutes myself, and uh, they they often take students whom the taxpayer funds are completely oblivious of the research that they are doing, mm -hmm. uh, which goes completely against the interests of the taxpayer at large and the government of the day, even, even if the government can be criticized. I agree the government should be criticized uh, by the academics. But uh, where I draw the line perhaps myself is that if you're criticizing the people of this country on very harsh, unfair terms uh, and, and misrepresenting a reality based often on very flimsy data, ethnographic data that, that you cannot verify, uh, you write an essay on Dalit oppression and that's your subjective view and that gets published, that kind of a thing. So uh, I agree with you that uh, the, the academics needs to be more public uh, because yeah. the public is democratic funded, accountability. Uh, there yeah, must look, be Christoph, far you're, you're, uh, you're assuming a view of the truth that other people, particularly the academics that you're criticizing, right. wouldn't accept. Mm -hmm. And how do we know the, 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 how do we know who's correct about these things? True. We never know 
which is yeah. why we turn to democracy. Yeah, fair enough. We turn to a vote and we say, well, we don't know who's right, but yeah. we'll take a vote about which way we want to go. Yeah. Absolutely. And we turn it into a polit and we so politicize it. And when people, almost all the intellectuals I know use the word politicize as a bad word. Mm. Uh, whereas I think that it's mostly yeah. a, a good word. Now, I have used it myself as a bad word. If you politicize hate speech, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's bad. Yeah. You know, you, you shouldn't yeah. pull it. But, but, but bringing these issues into the political realm, mm. I view as a positive because I don't know that you're right, Christoph. You may right. be wrong. Right. It may be that what's better for India in the long term is that this person who you believe is completely wrong that this person severely criticizes the Indi the Indian nation, not just the government, and that's what leads people to think about things and improve. So yeah. an Ambedkar out there, who an Ambedkar who says terrible things about the Hindu faith, in order to prompt it to reform its practices. Now he, he, that may not be his goal, and mm. he may ultimately die a, a Buddhist, mm. but his hectoring. Hmm. may be yeah. functional it may be good and, and i don't know the answer to that yeah so we have a question here from uh, from a regular viewer who lives in canada and has got up early just to ask you oh. questions uh, he's asking you recently akhilesh uh, pillamarri from the diplomat recently remarked that hindutva movement led by modi is analogous to major restoration what are your thoughts on this analogy yeah, so first, um, the Hindutva movement is not led by Modi. If anything, Modi is led by the Hindutva movement. Uh, that, that is, you know, it is a broad-based movement, uh, mm. not an astroturf. Well, now, I'm sure that the, the questioner agrees with me, but I want to make that clear, you know, to the outside world. Um, it, it, is it similar to the Meiji Restoration? There are, there are elements of national revival about it. And so you can make an analogy to it in that Hindutva is part of a broader national rejuvenation movement. And uh, I write about this in the, in the book I'm working on about the history of national rejuvenation. So actually I did a piece for first post about national rejuvenation movements. Like uh, the, the first recorded national rejuvenation movement is the Turnverein, the gymnastics movement in Germany under uh, Napoleon's occupation. And the idea that a German nation needed to be uh, forged. And that led ultimately to the 1848 Weimar Constitution, not to be confused with the Weimar Republic, a whole century before the Weimar Republic, mm -hmm. but a, you know, a liberal democratic um, unification of Germany under, you know, that was attempted in, in 1848. We could even go back and think of Joan of Arc in France as leading a national rejuvenation movement of the French people and a recognition of the French nation. So is Hindutva a similar movement to the Meiji Restoration? Yeah, it's analogous, but it's also analogous to many other movements for national rejuvenation um, in that it's a, you know, the idea is to create a new, a new ironically young identity for India by creating an ancient identity for India, but, you know, mm. to uh, organize Indians around a new vision of what their nation means. Okay. Um, and yeah, that's in some ways similar to what the Meiji's did in, in Japan. Right. But in many ways, it's different, right? Right. These, these are not identical. Right. Uh, Shuddha Roy is asking you, you know, what is the academic position on the rise of Hindutva and how much do they understand it objectively? Um, if you mean Western academia, they don't understand it at all. OK. Uh, I, I think. Uh, okay. And there's lots of mendacity around it and lots of name calling uh, around it. And there's lots of uh, actual mendacity. Uh, the problem is I see it with Western, and they prefer to call themselves South Asian scholars as opposed mm. to Indic or India scholars. Mm. The problem with Western South Asian scholars is they've become part of the political fights in the places they study. And, you know, when I come to India and I constantly get called, oh, Salvatore, you're such a lover of India. And I say, no, 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 no. I study India. India is an object for me. I mean, I love everyone. Everyone's been great to me. I appreciate it. You know, mm. namaskar or thank you. Uh, but it's just an object. And, and frankly, forgive me when I'm finished with India, I'll mm. go on, <laughs> you know, just as, just as I had my China decade in the 2010s, I'm having my India decade in the 2020s, and then maybe it'll be a Latin America decade in the 2030s. Who knows? Right. Um, the point is that I'm not emotionally involved with it. They mm. are. And so Hindutva mm. for them has become a bugbear. I mean, it's, it's a sign of 
um, you know, Hindu, well, as we used the word earlier, Hindutva is the new fascism. Hmm. And anyone who um, uh, endorses Hindutva is a new black shirt or brown shirt. And very easily they fall into this mythology of, you know, Hindu militias going around uh, conducting pogroms of, you know, Muslim shops, breaking the windows and torching them. And then they try to find evidence that this has happened. And they say, well, in this one village, you know, in 2017, some Hindu broke a window of a Muslim shop owner. It's like, yeah, but that's not the general experience of life of Muslims in India. That's not the general experience of, of Hindus in India. Um, you know, yes, there are, you know, youth groups. So the, the VHP, mm. you know, has, uh, you know, the Bajrang Dal, which is accused of being a, you know, stormtroopers. But mm -hmm. um, have you met some of them? Yes, I know there are occasions mm. when they have lynched people. Mm. Uh, but they didn't lynch people as Bajrang Dal activists. You know, they lynched them in defiance of mm. HP instructions because these are hot-headed young people who mm. do crime, who commit crimes. Right. Uh, the characterization, so the Hindutva narrative relies on the characterization of the RSS as a paramilitary Mm. organization that's something i constantly make fun of you see mm. the videos of, you know the old men mm. running around the circle yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know with their lathis and yeah. you think paramil you know, and and that word paramilitary has been stuck to the rss because of lathi training in the 1920s 30s yeah. um well it was lathi training not ak-47 training i mean mm. real paramilitary organizations train with guns not with sticks you, right. you know um, so yeah, the, the whole Hindutva narrative has just been wildly uh, perverted out of all uh, sense of reality. Now, are there illiberal aspects of Hindutva ideology? Yeah, there are illiberal aspects of it. Do I endorse Hindutva? No, I, I mean, it's not my ideology. But is Hindutva a pretty, a pretty ordinary hmm. um traditional nationalism that we could compare to traditional nationalisms in lots of other countries. Um, yeah, it, it's a, you know, it, it's a pretty ordinary, in comparative terms, it's a pretty ordinary traditionalist uh, seeking, it's trish, pretty ordinary movement seeking to manufacture an ancient tradition uh, for a new nation. Hmm. And that's been done many, many times. Yeah. yeah there's, no offense to Hindu to activists, it, it, you know, saying it's been done by many other people doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Yeah. It, it just means that it's pretty ordinary. It's a hmm. part of politics. Yeah. Uh, this question is uh, in the context of uh, our, our last night's uh, podcast. We had a professor of uh, philosophy uh, on our podcast and he said that objectivity is almost discouraged in humanities. And the question here by S. Chakraborty is that how to revive objectivity in humanities. So is that even a goal? Should objectivity be revised? Yeah, I tried to listen to that podcast and it, mm. it was just a little too difficult for me, at least at that late hour. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> oh, look, I've written about this a bit. Um, look, I, I believe in objectivity. I believe we should strive for objectivity. That said, I acknowledge that we never know what objective truth is. Only a God knows what objective truth is. So let me give you a simple, simple, simple example. Um, West Bengal has a population right now. Only God knows what that population is. Nobody knows. You know what the population was as it was measured in the 2011 census, yeah. which is still not what the population was. That, that was just a best estimate of the population. Hmm. You can estimate from there what it is now, but it's impossible to know. So my view is there is an object of truth. West Bengal has a population. Yeah. But if nobody knows exactly what that population is, that's empirically identical to there being no object of truth. Hmm. Empirically, we can't distinguish between these two propositions. It has an exact population that I can't possibly know or it doesn't have an exact population. Now, when it comes to something like exact population, even the most dyed in the wool, um, you know, uh, anti-positivist admits, oh, West Bengal has a population, I just don't know what it is, <laughs> right? But, but when we get to more complex things, um, is what will be the effect of a rise in uh, rice 
subsidies given to households in West Bengal? Well, that's a real social science question. Hmm. Does it have an objective answer? Well, you can say, oh, it has, because something will happen when you give the rice. Hmm. I say, well, yeah, but it doesn't have an objective answer because whenever I give the rice, other things will also happen. Hmm. And I can't know whether what happened was because I gave the rice or because COVID hit this year hmm. or because, you know, there was a, a thunderstorm hmm. that day. So is there an objective truth of the effect of a increased rice subsidy? I think there is, hmm. but that's, you know, even more, it's hard to say that there's some, there is an objective answer to what will be the effect. So it's hard to say that there's even an objective answer that I don't know. Right. You could argue that there is no objective answer as to what will be the effect of the rice subsidy. So, you know, when you get down to it, you just have, to, I'm a pragmatist, so I'll, I'll nail my colors to the mast. If you go read, you know, William James on pragmatism, uh, I'm very much a philosophical pragmatist. Um, we just do the best we can with the data we have. I mean, if, if I could summarize pragmatism in a sentence. Hmm. And someone asked here that can data science be used to, uh, to decrease subjectivity in humanities? No. Okay. Uh, th that's a hard no, I see. because the questions of the humanities are not questions that can be answered using data science. Um, data science is extremely effective at estimation problems. Okay. Uh, it's not very effective at understanding problems. Hmm. Uh, you know, so if you want to know a question like, um, what will the water level in the Ganges be three months from now? given existing rainfall and existing data science is fantastic you know, mm -hmm. for estimating that. Uh, if you want to understand um, what makes people turn to violence, um, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, it's, you know, it, it's just not the sort of problem. And, and that's a fundamental issue. It's not just that we don't have the data. You could say that as data science improves, we get better algorithms, we get more data. Um, the problem is that there's 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 a, a a fundamental problem called unit homogeneity. Okay. So a molecule of water is is a molecule of water is a molecule of water. It doesn't matter which molecule of water; they're all homogeneous. Hmm. Yet people are highly heterogeneous. Um, institutions are even more heterogeneous. So I could say a person is a person a person. So medical research is based on the idea that if something hurts my liver, it'll probably hurt your liver. Or probably, and, and that may not be correct. Hmm. But we can say people are sort of homogeneous units. When I get to institutions, um, racism as an institution, uh, is that homogeneous with another institution like um, the market economy? Hmm. Right. So I, I can never get enough institutions that are homogeneous in construction that I could possibly apply data science methods to the problem that is by construction data science can't solve these problems not not just because of a lack of data right um, that that canadian indian is asking professor can you define this mendacity that academics have for hindutva as part of a broader phenomenon is there, is there a pattern to this um there there are two intersecting problems um okay. one is in general uh, most academics tend to be anti-religious and most mm. Western academics. I'm sorry. I, I mean, obviously, if you're a, a monk studying in a Buddhist or a mm. Hindu monastery, you know, you're, you're an academic, you're not anti-religious. But but most Western academics uh, tend to be anti-religious. And so the mere fact that Hindutva is a religious, religiously based mm. um, ideology. Now, people will say it's not it's not. Hindu, it's Indian, it's a, mm. but but let's face facts. I mean, Hindutva is grounded in, um, it's ultimately grounded in in Hindu faith. Yeah, uh, one construed one way or another. So the fact that it's religiously based is the first problem. Why academics tend to be blinded, have a blind spot when it comes to Hindutva, and the second reason is that uh, academia tends to be strongly, specifically anti-Hindu in ways that academia is not anti-Muslim, is not anti-Shinto, uh, is not anti-Buddhist. Um, and that, I think, is a historical issue. It has to do with the long-lasting legacies of colonialism uh, mm. in India, with um, you know the, the unity of Abrahamic faiths. Uh, I, I mean, ironically, 
not Judaism. <laughs> so the the unity of of let's say uh, proselytizing faiths. Yeah. Um, uh, controversially, I, I view Islam as a Christian her heterodoxy. Uh, mm. you know, Islam and Christianity are actually very close uh, mm. in, in sociological terms, even if mm. Hindus and Christians may not see themselves as close. Mm. Um, we can go into that if someone wants to. But um, so what Hindutva has against it in academia has those, both those problems. First, that it's religious, and second, that the religion, religion is Hindu, and there's lots of anti-Hinduism in the academy. Mm. So uh, some questions are for you, which I don't think might be relevant for you, but uh, please answer them if you want to. Uh, sure. What relevance does Bangladesh bring into current developments? Um, personally, I think that West Bengal, that the development problems of West Bengal over the past you know, 70 years probably stem from the creation of the state of Bangladesh. Okay. Uh, that Bangladesh is naturally speaking Calcutta's hinterland. Mm. And when that hinterland was removed from the orbit of Calcutta, it uh, had a, probably a very long-term effect on the development of Calcutta and West Bengal. And I think when we ask, I know on, on a previous show you were talking about uh, the Bengali versus Hindi languages and the politics mm. of using Bengali versus Hindi. Mm. Had West, had uh, uh, East Bengal remained part of a an independent India. Hmm. Bengali would be much closer to Hindi hmm. as a number of speakers, you know, as a language group. Yeah, and I think the importance of Bengali literature and the importance of Bengali cinema, et cetera, hmm. you know, would have would have rivaled that. You know, India would have two major languages. Hindi would still be the dominant language, but Bengali would be much more a major language hmm. than it is now. So. So Bangladesh has an impact, particularly for West Bengal, I think, that mm. um, is just a, you know, a sad uh, effect of the outcomes of history. Right. Uh, the next question is, what should be techniques to handle Islamic propaganda by Qatar, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera etc. and to stop Christian funded NGOs from West? Because uh, here in Christianity, here Christianity is like pre-industrial Christianity in Europe. Yeah, so I'll, this, I'll answer the second question first, which is, I think, I would recommend that India make a clear distinction in law and in rhetoric mm. between propagation and proselytization. Mm. This is something that was debated in India's constituent assembly debates, where the when the word was settled on that people in India had the right to propagate their religion, mm. propagate in ordinary English usage does not necessarily mean, and for many people it does not mean missionary activity. Propagate mm. means I can teach my children my religion. Mm. I can have a Sunday school at my church. Mm. Um, I can have a Christian school. Mm. So I propagate within my community mm. as opposed to proselytize outside the community. Right. Now, that's become more or less the view of Indian courts and Indian law, but it hasn't been formalized. And right. I would really recommend that, um, that India formalize this distinction so that it will be clearer, especially to Western organizations, because India takes a lot of, um, it takes both uh, Western liberal and, and radical, you know, progressive uh, criticism mm. for human rights, but then it also takes conservative Christian criticism of India's human rights. And there's this strange, I called it in a paper, the unholy alliance mm. you know, between Christian conservatives um, Al Jazeera and the you know the Muslim Brotherhood hmm. uh, and radical human rights you know, hmm. secular human rights activists right. strange group and and I would I would recommend that India work hard to pry Christian conservatives off that hmm. alliance and get them on side uh, by emphasizing the commonalities between people of faith hmm. and by making it very explicit that mm. India is not anti-Christian, mm. but India makes a distinction between propagation and proselytization and, and mm. propagation is entirely supported, not just legal, mm. supported, encouraged, nurtured mm. in India. Um, so I, I, would, I would try to make that much clearer in Indian law. As for what to do for uh, about um, Gulf Arab propaganda, that's a real challenge because while to me, I view it as propaganda, but remember, I, I view Hindutva as propaganda, right? I, I'm, I'm neither Hindu nor Muslim. I, I have no, you know, 
I've been characterized as being pro-Hindutva simply because I'm not anti-Hindutva. Mm. <laughs> okay. Right, right. Um, I'm not anti-Hindutva, but I'm also not anti-Muslim. Mm. Right. Um, so the problem India has with that is that um, many Indian Muslims uh, strongly support the viewpoints coming out of the Gulf. Remember the Deobandi movement in mm. India yeah. um, is really similar in time to the Wahhabi movement. Yeah. in Saudi Arabia and was much more influential mm. uh, until recently, I mean, until Saudi Arabia discovered oil yeah, or yeah. took control of its oil. So in, until 1973, mm. Deobandi, you know, Indian Deobandi uh, ideology was probably more mm. important as a force than mm. Wahhabism. Yes. Uh, now, of course, Saudi money makes Wahhabism you know, mm. more influential and Qatari yeah. money makes, you know, so, um, so I'm not sure that India really can do much to mm. counter it because the you know because there is that civil connection within india that um must be respected because you know people have a right to their own points of view and if you know just because you may find that point of view unpalatable and because i may find that point of view unpalatable um it is a point of view that is uh, embraced by many indians and mm. i think that has to be treated sensitively mm. uh i'm not sure what can be done probably the most effective thing is india continuing to build diplomatic relationships in the gulf region right. which results in gulf governments themselves wanting to tone down the that propaganda mm. because mm. they want good relations with india mm. fair enough uh, okay someone is asking uh, how prevalent do you see marxian viewpoints in academia in the present day there's a lot of lip service paid to Marx and very few people read Marx. Uh, and there's tons of Marxism without Marx in it, which, um, what does it mean? <laughs> so, um, so if the question is how prevalent is, um, are, how ident how prevalent are self identified critical approaches, hmm. uh, which broadly connects, you know, what people call Marxism, what people call cultural Marxism. I don't like the word cultural Marxism because it has nothing to do with Marx, mm. uh, Maoism. These sorts of approaches, you know, radical approaches taken mm. together are very common and they reflect mm. a, forgive me, fellow academics, for what I'm about to say, mm. they reflect a, an, a, an undergraduate student uh, understanding of society. Mm. So the, the radical approach is mainly, I believe, supported by people who never grew up from being students. And for students, it sounds very attractive. You know, we're going to have these reforms that are going to remake the world right. for, for the good of all. It's ideal. It's highly idealistic. And then when you confront students with the challenges that are posed by this, they, they back off it. But of course, academics, most of them have never had to face those challenges because they've been students then graduate students, then junior mm. academics, then senior academics, and they've never faced the implications. So let me make, a, at the risk of going on too long, let me just make this very, very clear with an example I give my own mm. students. None of us like, um, all of us like equality of opportunity. Okay, we, we can argue over equality of outcome. Let, let's mm. not even go there. Mm. We all like equality of opportunity. How can we have equality of opportunity when some people have parents who are alcoholics mm. and other people have parents who are um, well behaved, you know, and the alcoholic, let's say, let's say some people are born to an alcoholic pimp and a prostitute. Let's be extreme. Hmm. Another person is born to um, well behaved barristers. Hmm. Okay, we give them all the same educational opportunities, the same, you know, is that a quality of opportunity? Of course it isn't. Hmm. So then we quickly get to things like, you know, Orwellian things that were really considered back in the 1920s that were implemented in Sweden in the 1930s and 40s of, well, let's take children out of the home. Yeah. Because, of course, some children are more advantaged because they have better parents. So we'll have the state raise the children. Yeah. And then, OK, that will make greater equality. Now, we still have the problem of inequalities start in the womb. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the prenatal, the antenatal environment, the prenatal environment yes. creates inequalities. Um, so, okay, now we have to have designate, and we could have, you know, in a science fiction dystopia, hmm. designated breeders who, in whom we implant eggs, fertilized eggs, hmm. 
And you know, well, will we quickly get into a situation if the, if all we want is a quality of opportunity? Hmm. Let's not even argue about a quality of outcomes and affirmative. Hmm. All we want is a quality of opportunity. What all of the conservatives in Australia, for example, and in America say they want. Even that requires us to implement a the worst Stalinist regime imaginable, where children are taken away from their families before birth or at birth at a minimum, hmm. educated by the state. Well, you know, who wants that? No one wants that. Okay, well, then we can't have real communism. <laughs> right? Communism will never have the opportunity to be tried. Yeah. And it's like, well, so, but the problem is I have so many academic colleagues who don't want to face those obvious problems. Right. That confront anyone who wants to deal with real world social policy. And instead, talk about, you know, utopias that can't possibly exist on Earth. Hmm. Therefore, shouldn't we just stick to uh, legally, theoretically allowing uh, equality of opportunity and nothing more? I just told you we can't have a quality of opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm going to say Nirajan said that all children should be taken away from their parents at birth to provide a quality of opportunity. <laughs> no, that, that's the plot of Man of Steel, by the way. Uh, okay, so, uh, plot of who? Man of Steel, the the L Superman movie from 2013. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's how <laughs> you, Superman was illegally born. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's like, so we can't even have that. So, yeah, now California is already trying that. They are going to even uh, even some Republican states are, are have decided to take children away if if their parents don't conform to their or don't agree no, with no, their no, gender. No, 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 all children. All children have to be taken away to provide a quality of right. opportunity. Right. Um, so so what we do so real world social policy and I'm sorry to go on at such length for, yeah, for yeah. this question, but um, the problem with most humanities and social science academics is they don't want to deal with real world policy. Hmm. For that, you have to look to think tanks. Think tanks deal with the real world. The real world question is, um, should, should women be given um, 12 months of paid maternal leave? Okay, that's something we can really do, <laughs> hmm. right? Um, that won't create a communist world. Hmm. That'll still be embedded in our dirty capitalist system. Hmm. Um, but it does help equalize um, some aspects of society. Hmm. What motivated you to uh, read India? As you said, read India. Uh, I was originally doing work on the Indian economy. My own, uh, I would say, well, I will say my, my own specialism to the extent I have one has been in studying post-socialist transition economies. Uh, I've done a bit of work on Latin America, a lot of work on Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, and a lot of work, especially on China as post-social transition economies, a little on Vietnam. And I had started to study India first with a 20, I think it was 2015 book, 2016 book on the BRICS called BRICS or Bust, Escaping the Middle Income Trap, hmm. where I wrote the India yeah. chapter of that book. That was my oh. first art, my first bit of work on India, serious work on India. Um, and I had intended uh, to really get more deeply into economic reform in India. And in 20, if you look at my articles from around 2019, 2020, you'll see most of them focus on economic reform in India. But uh, I quickly became conscious that the real issue was the democracy. And that really hit me when I wrote an article for Foreign Policy magazine on the 2019 farm protests. Hmm. Uh, and 2019, 2020, tw it started in 2019, I believe, yeah. the farm protests. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to, I, I actually gave it the title, India's Rich Farmers Block Pro-Poor Reform. Hmm. And uh, reviewers and everybody was aghast. How could I say that? And, and I was just a data person. I, yeah. I, at the time, I wasn't doing any Indian politics at the time. Okay. At the time, I was just saying, look, uh, farmers in Punjab and Haryana hmm. have much larger farms than in the rest of India. Yeah. The farm protesters have tractors as their main symbol, but only fewer than 5% of India's farmers have tractors. If you look at the actual farm laws, they would benefit poorer farmers at the expense of middlemen. I said, there's every reason to believe hmm. that the laws would benefit poor farmers and harm the largest, richest farmers who get the yeah. biggest subsidies. Uh, and that was so resisted politically, that, hmm. that, that message. It was like, how could you dare say this? You're hmm. supporting Narendra Modi. And I yeah. thought, I don't care about it. <laughs> I never, you know, like I knew his name, but I had never studied him. I know, you know, and that that caused me to really shift research away from questions of economic reform in India 
and these problems I was very interested in, like parti- the, like I was very interested in this issue of the, the effective partition on the economies of Bengal on the one side and Punjab on the other, hmm. uh, and how this might have been uh, affected by, I was very interested in these questions of Indian economic development. I put that all aside and said, I'm going to focus on the politics. And so I've done this work on Indian democracy instead. Uh, I had a journalism professor in my college who said that, what will the middlemen do then? What about their employment? <laughs> they always find a job somewhere. Yeah. The, uh, we have a super chat question here. Is this a latent hate against polytheism slash pagans slash Bhagwan from atheist in bracket Sino and monotheists, meaning Ab- uh, Abrahamic, coming back to quote unquote fight the devil like India and BJP? Uh, yes, but uh, it's specifically directed at India as opposed to, say, Japan or Mongolia. Uh, you know, the reason it's, it's specifically leveled at India, I think, is a legacy of British colonialism and a British ruling class in India that um, convinced itself that, uh, you know, that the Hindu religion was inferior. Hmm. Now, today, in our, the, the funny thing for me is, and, and is I repeatedly see this phenomenon that even though Western society is post-Christian, that is, hmm. very few of the academics who are anti-Hindu are themselves Christian. Uh, even though their society is post-Christian, it retains the prejudices that it inherited from Christian society, thus all the anti-Semitism hmm. in the West. The anti-Semitism is no longer driven by Jews killed Jesus. In, in fact, its Christian churches are more are less likely to be anti-Semitic than intellectuals. Hmm. But intellectual anti-Semitism, just like the intellectual anti-Hinduism, is a intellectual anti-Semitism is a carryover of Christianity. Hmm. Intellectual anti-Hinduism is a carryover of colonialism. Hmm. At least that's how I see it. I can't know for certain. I haven't done detailed biographical work on this, but that seems to me to be the the origins. Hmm. Uh, okay, here's an interesting one. Uh, uh, he's asking you to state three things that you think India is not doing the right way or is not paying attention to as a post-socialist transition economy. That's difficult because I haven't really put in the time I shifted the study of India. Uh, I will say, though, there's one obvious thing, which is uh, agricultural reform. Uh you have something like, I, I forget the number, I think it's 45% of Indians are still, in, of working Indians are still engaged in agriculture. India needs to bring that down to 5%. The only way to do that is by, um, ultimately, farms have to grow in size. Now, I'm thoroughly opposed to the uh, communist way of collect, doing that via collectivizing farms forcefully. I, I think instead setting up a policy environment that allows small farmers to cash in, essentially, on their farm. So allows them to alienate farmland and to sell it. Uh, that has a, an organized system for that so that people don't get um, bullied or, you know, have their, their livelihoods taken away or trampled. But some organized way to liberalize agriculture in India with the effect that most farmers and most farming families move off the farm over the next 20 years yeah. uh, is simply the number one thing India has to do to promote development. No matter how fast the non-agricultural sector grows, if a half or a third of the population is still engaged in agriculture, that'll be a drag on India's growth rate, um, no matter what India does in every other area. Thank and I'll give one thing that India doesn't yeah. need to do. Um, hmm. What India shouldn't do is go down the Bangladesh route of specializing in sweatshop manufacturing. Hmm. Lots of Western exactly. economists keep saying, oh, India should have a manufacturing economy, provide employment. Um, that kind of economics is is completely divorced from serious economic theory. Hmm. Uh, there's nothing in economic theory. Uh, let me put it differently. As countries grow, we've never had an economy where countries grow, and because it's growing, there was mass unemployment. So this this intuitive economics idea that um, you have to provide employment for large numbers of people with big factories. That's there's no theoretical basis for that, and there's very little empirical basis for that. Uh, in fact, India is already proportionally a bigger manufacturing economy than I'm mm. sorry, exporting economy mm. than uh, than uh, Bangladesh is. Um, but India's exports are concentrated in high value added areas. That is, India's exports, the biggest exports are 
cut diamonds and uh, refine petroleum. Mm. And that's a much better route for India to go mm. to specialize in high value added activities like refining petroleum. And I would not give incentives to create low value added activities like making T-shirts. Let, mm. let Bangladesh yeah. make the T-shirts. India should do higher value added activities. Mm. Don't you think agriculture is the future and therefore we might prosper by doing agriculture more or better? Yeah, yeah. Look, you'll prosper by doing everything more productively. So mm. GDP per capita is simply the average productivity mm. across the whole population. Mm. So, yes, high productivity agriculture, like in Australia, agriculture is exceptionally high productivity and it contributes to GDP. Anything that's low productivity is a drag on GDP. Mm. Uh, India's agriculture in a per capita basis is of much lower productivity than, say, being a tuk-tuk driver. Hmm. And so average productivity in India has improved when someone moves off the farm, moves to Delhi, and drives a tuk-tuk. Even right. that little gain in productivity benefits GDP. Hmm. You don't have to move from agriculture to being a tech startup. Mm -hmm. you know, just moving from agriculture to some higher value-added activity hmm. right. will improve. Now, but, but that's what... You know, agriculture leading development mm -hmm. and agriculture employing fewer people are flip sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. um, agriculture will lead development if instead of having 20 farmers on a small patch of land, you have one farmer with a tractor on that patch of land. Yeah, That's what leads to higher productivity. And I know we are nearing the end of our time with you. Um, we ha we'll just take one or two here. Oh, where did it go? Where if you want to go through all the questions from the chat, I'll try to answer them all very quickly and then we can go and yeah. close up for the night. Uh, what is the latest update to uh, Indian Century Roundtable and what are its goals? We're still developing. We have a board meeting next week and uh, we have the Australia relations because U.S. donors have not come forward in sufficient numbers. Uh, I know you were kind enough to do a whole podcast on the uh, cast, uh, weaponization of cast in America, yeah. uh, but that did not bring in uh, sufficient U.S. donors to justify us focusing on global India issues. Okay. We're going to have to focus on Australia India issues. Okay. Do you think efforts should be made for population control to reduce pressure on land? Efforts should be made for what? Sorry? Uh, population control to reduce pressure on land. No. Uh, population control is not an issue for India. India has a uh, fertility rate that's just above replacement. Um, there are arguments for population control when fertility is wildly out of control, but hmm. that's not the situation in India, and um, it's just not relevant today. We could argue about it if India's fertility rate were five or six, but India's fertility rate at two point one, it's not even it's not even worth thinking about. Hmm. How can India become a manufacturer of high-end technology with e with economy of scale? India has economy of scale, which is one great structural advantage India has, which is a very large internal market. The the um, harmonization of the value added tax system in India was mm. a big win. I yeah. think that was the right direction. Anything India can do to create truly national markets as opposed to regional or local markets in India will be the probably the easiest way to promote that. Mm. Uh, how can Indian... Uh how can India be able to create more stronger academia group to study West, China, and even Australia, like West is doing since British period by sending Indologists? How can we do the same to West? Uh, that's very difficult. Um, India just doesn't pay enough, and it's unlikely to pay enough any time in the future to attract even the best Indian academics have strong incentives to go abroad just because the pay is higher. Right. It's a difficult challenge. China has done it by being... Uh, both highly repressive and also by giving enormous subsidies for Chinese abroad to stay connected to China. But I'm not sure that's a good use of money. Hmm. It's it produces prestige, but I'm not sure it produces anything useful for China. Right. Uh, what would it... Uh, is there any situation where uh, we can have you uh, as, as a senior professor or head of some great department in India? I had one offer, one serious offer of a deanship in India that I strongly considered. Mm. Uh, the biggest uh, roadblock, if I can be very frank, was the air quality, because no matter mm. how good the job is, if you mm. have to breathe the air in Delhi, <laughs> well, I'm serious. It's uh, yeah. 
you know, it's a serious problem. So if anyone wanted me to come work in India, uh, the number one thing would be to clean up the environment first. <laughs> yeah, Bengal would be best for that. Okay, sir. Thank you for uh, coming to our podcast. We don't have any more questions. Oh, there is one more question. What do sure. you think our language policy could be to integrate the local markets into the national market? Again, that's very difficult. Uh, I understand the language sensitivities in India around regional, especially South Indian languages. That mm. that sensitivity goes all the way back to the constituent assembly debates. Um, for instance, on at uh, on August fourteenth, nineteen forty seven. Uh, uh, Radhakrishnan uh, spoke in English, uh, not, you know, he couldn't, yeah, I think he is, um, I think he's a native Telugu speaker, if I have it right. Uh, but of course, he couldn't speak in Telugu. Uh, others had spoken Hindi, hmm. but he chose to spoke, speak in English. And that, hmm. that, that language problem has been there. Uh, look, India's states are large enough that even having state level markets mm. is provides substantial economies of scale of course um multilingualism in india is far more advanced than in most of the world i mean i'm a monolingual english speaker it's amazing to me that so many indians every indian i know is at least bilingual most are trilingual mm. and you know some have four or five languages yeah. uh, it's really incredible uh, but i would suggest that um the economies of scale are sufficiently large even within states that India should be thinking more about uh, local language education. Um, so, for example, uh, there's a lot of evidence that something like uh, medical education, medical education is probably the best example. Medical mm. education should not be in English except in peak institutions. Mm. And other than the very peak institutions, language, uh, medical education should be in the language of the state. And that would have two beneficial effects. First would be doctors would be better able to communicate with their patients. Right. Uh, and the second effect would be far fewer doctors would go to work overseas. Yeah. And so there'd be less brain drain. So in, India can use its language diversity to its advantage mm. in some case. Um, for good or for bad, yes. I mean, it, it would have been, it, it was a missed opportunity in 1947 that in theory, India could have had a national language. Sanskrit could have been revived, mm. frankly. English could have been made the national language as much mm. as that would have annoyed lots of people. It, it mm. sort of happened. Mm. Your peak institutions are, yeah. were, were in English mm. in 1947. Uh, constituent assembly debates were in English. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, Hindi dominance is just too politically sensitive and Hindi is not sufficiently dominant mm. uh, for there to be one language for India in the yeah. foreseeable future. Yeah. yeah, maybe after 2100, Hindi will win out. But India is not China. Mm. And whether it would be good i mean i think that i think i don't know uh i think that the um the promotion of a single language in china and the standardization of the chinese language has probably been good for the chinese economy hmm. but it comes at such a human cost that i don't a democracy wouldn't do it hmm. and i don't think a democracy should do it um sometimes you accept that the economy isn't everything hmm. and um, you know, people can celebrate their own cultures and their own languages as long as it's practical within limits. You know, some languages can't be maintained because they only have 10,000 speakers. But if hmm. you're in a state with where the language is spoken by 20 million people, hmm. yeah, that can be maintained without any serious losses of economies of scale. Remember economies of scale don't really scale up. Mm. <laughs> right so a market of of 1 million may be too small mm. but whether you have a market of 100 million or a billion for your product hardly yeah. matters right because the fixed costs of serving a market of 100 million that fixed cost is already spread over so many people that yeah it doesn't matter and uh, so you know i would encourage indians to just to be proud of their languages and not be so concerned about the pressure that you know other countries have a national language so india mm. has to also Seen from the outside, hmm. in India's linguistic diversity is one of the, the great attractions of India. And I'm very impressed. Hmm. And I hope Indians can be very proud of the diversity of their linguistic landscape. Hmm. I'm certainly envious. I see. Uh, we have a great one here. In India, there is an age limit to becoming an academic, disallowing lateral inflow. Is it the same in Australia? Do you think there should be more people in, from industry in, in academia? 
Well, I tried to give you an inspiring answer on language to close with. Yeah. <laughs> What's, uh, is the age limit in India, uh, you have to be above a certain age or below a certain age? Uh, by 28. Uh, Oh, yeah, he can answer oh, no. it better. 28 is uh, the funding. It's uh, like, so in many government institutions, there's a upper limit of 30 or uh, 39 or 40 years, 42 years. Is, is the oldest you can be to get started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I always yeah, I mean, that we're not joining an army, right? So, I mean. Yeah, look, the, these limits are, um, are probably reasonable for a poor country with scarce resources. Hmm. In places like Australia, a lot of government money is spent on PhD training for retirees. Because there are no, you, know, you can't discriminate, and so we all celebrate when someone who's retired and seventy-five years old does a PhD, and we think, "Oh, see, yeah, you're yeah. never too old." Yeah. Well, that's a hundred thousand dollars of government money that was spent to train someone who's never going to enter the workforce. Hmm. And I, I, that kind of misallocation is something we can, we can, you know, we can afford a certain level of misallocation in Australia. It's a very rich country. Right. I think it's reasonable in a poor country for mm. there to be some prioritization um, in educating the youth and not educating the elderly. Right. It's a reasonable, and this is when I talk about, I'm gonna give this inspiring answer. Uh, this is when it's reasonable, you know, when you have to think about public policy problems in terms of practical constraints. You know, ideally you might like to have something, but you know, what can the country afford? What will happen to other people who don't get it? Is the money better spent somewhere? These are the practical stuff of real policy uh, that has to be dealt with. And, you know, you end up with compromises that are not perfect. There may have been one better person who was 35 than the worst person who was 28 who got it. But in general, if the policy works well to allocate resources more effectively than without it, we you know, we, we, we take it and we have an evolutionary approach to policy where we tweak and tweak and tweak to try to make policy more effective hmm. instead of having some ideal policy that then collapses like the French Revolution. Right. Thank you very much. I for encourage your time, everyone sir. to read Edmund Burke. You may not want to read yeah. English colonial authors. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Read Edmund Burke on uh, the re reflections of the revolution in France. Uh, for an idea of why policy should evolve instead of be created from scratch. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. And it Thank was you. a huge honor to host you. And we hope to have you back sometime soon. I'd love to do it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so All much. Right. Take care. Have a good Thank night. You, good night, sir. Okay, Mr. Sociologist. Oh, he left. Wait. I'll ask Mr. Sociologist to come back. And... Uh, if he can share his thoughts on this, we can have sort of a uh, review and a review of sorts. Let me call him up. I, I guess he is listening to it anyway. Ek tu abar firiyasho to Google Meet e tu eter review alo chona kori. Oh, this was exciting. I was so nervous with this man. Great, we got to so many questions. See, this is a this is a great academic. Imagine taking a class with this person because he's so concise, so precise, and uh, answers them <laughs> so quickly. T time flies by. Questions end so soon. <laughs> uh, and and we got to so many questions, and he gets such in-depth, precise, concise answers. Hello. Oh, hi. Sorry. I was just. Uh, my uh, background. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> uh -huh. What did you think of this, Mr. Sociologist? Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, this was a great opportunity for me uh, mm. personally. Uh, but more also for your channel and all that. But mm -hmm. what I was uh, enthralled by was his uh, frankness and more importantly, his uh, neutrality. Like this is one of, this is a dream of uh, uh, no, objectivity, right? He did yeah. not, he could have easily, you know, appealed to the audience sympathies and said, oh, India is great. Hindut was great. I love India. Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. yeah, if he said those things, my, my podcast would have a million subscribers by tomorrow, probably. But we can't have fruitful solutions with those things. 
precisely and mm. i think what his stre- where his strength lies is pragmatism like mm. is like ye karna like even the age thing right like mm. i if you asked me i would have said yeah get 50 year old people into academics but yeah. he gave such a wonderful i wonderful never thought answer. about it that way exactly. i never I thought about it that way and, uh like that's that's his strength i think he's one of the last few objective sociologists i know like yeah and, and the... i think a true liberal he's not married to any ideology not married to any uh, idea no, not no, married no. to even a country and like he said india is an object of study for him yeah. of course he he uh, enjoys his uh, time here and all that yeah, but yeah. that doesn't make him a you know a, a nationalist or a hindutvadi or this hmm. or that or a conservative person exactly. and i think that I is isn't that, that what was uh, liberal arts academia funded for or started for in the first place this is what a uh, what a liberal arts academic is supposed to be the the tragedy is that he is one of the few i have heard of who are like this or who have seen or like this, who are actually neutral actually objective in their uh, you know research and their words and everything yeah. which is weird because uh, when when you go to any and and i think that's uh, the fact that he you know i i think he did not like that part where i did say that you know <laughs> that uh you know social sciences uh, don't do justice to a lot of things and there's mm. fascism in bengal yeah even that, that response was pretty pretty constructive and and fruitful no he did say say it right that technically bengal people in west bengal have the power to vote out mahota banerjee yeah right i could call it fascist which is which i still would Mm-hmm. but yeah. yeah i mean we we have been electing her popularly. actually it's not like she, she put a gun to our head and told us to all of us to vote of course that would be the case in some like right. panchayat election and all but fact is in the bidhan sabha lok sabha people have voted hindus have voted for her yeah right? even this time most communists are going to vote for trinamool the precisely and look at and 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 like indira gandhi had the most objectively only fascist rule in objectively like closest to perhaps what yeah. germany uh, had uh, that the closest we have was indira gandhi hmm. right 75 to 77 yeah. but that's what i'm saying he is right like he you can't you can't fault him on a on 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 facts he's like he's ben shapiro's i think like greatest i mean guru guru if you can call him that because he's yeah. much older and much more experienced yeah <laughs> facts don't care about feelings for him and that's yeah he that's... easily pissed off many hindutvadis or or trads right wingers everyone <laughs> in this interview he pissed off everyone in this interview he pissed me off pars partially <laughs> in in some ways and that's okay that's it's okay yeah. like i i i i respect somebody who's like this is why i respect max weber personally mm. because max weber did not want to hate this country because it's not capitalist or love that country because it is capitalist and mm-hmm. all that he did his research he wanted to find answers to questions right he mm. he same as this guy same mm. as professor babunas he just wants to a- 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 ask questions that why are farmers blocking a uh, pro poor uh, you know yeah. uh, reform in agriculture and yeah. why what is the source of this what are the benefits of this yeah. what are the advantages wait to or any said if small farmer ka baat chhodo get big farmers uh, this that like he's he's right he's right on in many ways hmm. do i agree with him 100% no but but that's the thing like he would probably be liberal enough to say that okay you may not agree with me i think he's he liberal facts, enough to get statistical data and facts to convince me of his view yeah it's something you have to respect which is gone which is gone in liberal arts academy i know he kind of skirted the issue in a different way he said that bhai it's up to you guys to defund or whatever hmm. but fact is that as you are well aware that um in the name of sociology and and even economics and uh, many other uh, social sciences there's a joke there's a mockery of uh, objectivity and Hmm. it's all about oppression feelings of oppression and feelings of this and that and yeah i guess he took the uh, proper true neutral outsider's perspective here that yeah then debate it among yourselves let them fight <laughs> yeah 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 and one thing i do believe is that um there should be questions to academics people who hmm. get nice funding from the government lakhs and lakhs of funds and salaries from the government that bhai tere research se logo ka kya benefit hua 
Hmm. Yeah, I, I really yeah. liked his perspective on accountability. That was really yeah, yeah. That should be the case. Your you should defend your thesis publicly. Your hmm. people, a rickshaw wala, should ask me that you know what what is the research you're doing on this country and why are you doing it? That that can't that can't be it because you can't explain no, it, but, everything to but everyone. But fact is, fact is that I believe that it is because of the 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 unreliability that I have on the. uh the the professional class that he mentioned doctors lawyers engineers these mm. people they are firstly they have been they have been living in a simulacrum of uh created by the left mm. so if i say that if somebody says uh the the kashmiri genocide pandit genocide was not uh, uh, an objective truth there are only 10 people left or mm. two people killed and all that stuff many people have done that by the way mm. then so- he don't care about it the the weird thing is the taxpayers don't seem to care but if if i were to tell this to a random person on the street who is totally unaware of all this stuff happening right hmm. then i guess their objective reply would be yeah let but why are you writing all this yeah you're wrong right or if i if i say partition was uh, so but your family is a victim of partition right hmm. uh so if i say you people were the landed zamindars who oppressed everyone and you were kicked out of bangladesh for a good reason yeah. and etc would that do just would if i if i go and tell the the million the millions of partition victims of west bengal and punjab that you know you people were the landed caste acha kya pakistaniyon ne laat mar diya and all that would you guys like that <laughs> no but that is being written by people like amrit sen and others right that is being written by many people yeah. the government has been funding yeah we were not the landed class we were the gumchard class we, we <laughs> it doesn't and... matter my point is you you have to have objectivity like he said i want to understand the economic effects of partition yeah right even ambedkar when he said what are the reasons of partition he actually studied the history of islam he studied the ideology of islam and said ha bhai ye sab dekh ke mujhe lagta hai ki partition hone wala hai mm-hmm. you can't prevent it and it happened right yeah so we need objective social sciences that's what i got from this talk and again that that aligns very closely with my own views yeah and the key takeaway is his quote here which i hope goes viral is that the government is the pr arm of <laughs> academia ne wo to hai and i, I think, think he said- is uh, liberal enough to uh, get kicked out of canada if if he was also in in therapy psychology etc i think his license would also get cancelled if he was in canada yeah 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 he the only reason i think he's like still there in australia because australia is not not like entered luni land and hmm. look at it this way strangely australia ka liberal government has defunded sociology and and no one knows about it <laughs> nobody knows the beans. nobody cares nobody cares <laughs> bhai white liberals do it हा मैं वही बोलने वाला था आई डिट डिस्टर्ब इज फ्लो ऑफ थॉट मैं वही बोलने वाला था कि एंड देन ही सेड आल्सो कि फ्लोरिडा में करते तो प्रॉब्लम होता है इफ मोदी डज इट टुमारो दैट फॉर डिफंड सोशियोलॉजी या देन बवाल हो जाएगा सारे दुनिया में बवाल होगा बट ऑस्ट्रेलियन लिबरल गवर्नमेंट दो दिन पहले कर दिया नोबडी बैटेड एन एनी या ओ या रोहन रोहन इज करेक्टिंग द कोट हियर गवर्नमेंट इज पॉलिटिकल आर्म ऑफ एकेडमिया Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah i think we'll need to change the thumbnail to that by the way considering the kind of power hmm. that certain professors and others have who have shown in the bastar the bastar movie and all that hmm. uh, those who have seen will know what i'm talking about or even even buddha in a traffic jam and all hmm. um that is a reality that professors in in higher education uh, which is why i hide my face right like they could get you killed Gopal mm. Shen was murdered. Uh, he was the Jadavpur VC, mm. and he was murdered by Naxalites. Okay, mm. check up that story. Brutally murdered simply because he told them to take exams and stuff. So, right. so, so professors in India have a lot of power because mm. they were the agents of the Soviet mm. Union, and later on other international, uh, other interests in the US and all. Okay. So they have tremendous power. he's right he, he, i mean maybe he said that as a joke but it's kind of right hmm okay as closing statements for our live stream uh, we will quote a viewer here from the live chat who is saying uh, uh, three interesting things from the same person okay are you ready for this yeah amortoshen amar pran don't insult 
why are you insulting the great Amartya Sen? And his previous sentence is that we are liking Salvatore Babunes so much and he is saying such great important things because he has more Aryan blood than you, Shudras. This <laughs> is <laughs> 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 troll, hai, bhai. Yeah, I love now, how, yeah, how now, trolls yeah, boost the now, live chat algorithms. Who, 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 who is this great person? His name is By The Way. Oh, ba- oh his name is By The Way. Okay. Yeah. Okay, nice, Mr. Nice. Sociologist, uh, looking forward Thank to seeing you, you soon, probably by Monday. By the way, no, by Neerajan, not by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, it's wonderful. And I, I hope that uh, these kind of sociologists keep, keep like coming up, coming back. Let's say. Yeah. Hoga nahi. It's wishful thinking, but <laughs> let's see. Okay. Good night then. Uh, not good night. Good evening, Mr. Sociologist. Good. Thank you yeah. for joining everyone. Ta-ta.